So welcome to this interactive session on the role of a dietitian in head and neck. So in this session, we're going to run through who we are, what we do and how we can help your patients on the ward. So in the head and neck dietitian team, there's me, Katie, I work half in head, neck and burns and Amy, who works fully in head and neck. So you've got our contact numbers and our bleeps on the screen there. And we look after all of the mid Essex head and neck oncology patients, as well as general ENT, max fax and plastics in patients. On the screen now, we've got some of the effects of malnutrition in head and neck cancer patients. These can occur from side effects of treatment, so chemo, radio, surgery. 50 to 75% of patients with head and neck tumours will become malnourished and 10 to 20% of these will die from the malnutrition rather than the cancer. So it's really important that we can try and combat that malnutrition if we can. This is the MUST tool. So this will be in all the nursing notes and it stands for Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool. The nurses will fill this out on the ward and it takes into account weight loss, BMI and if the patient isn't eating and drinking. And anyone with a MUST score of two or more will get referred to the dietitian. So with step three, anyone not eating and drinking, that'll be all of our nil by mouth patients, all of our entry fed patients. So they automatically will get referred to the dietitian. So that's just a tool to see um, more for the nurses, but just so you know what the MUST is and how to refer. Here we've got some of the common barriers to oral intake and how we can help overcome this. MDT working is really important for this, especially working with dietitians, speech and language therapy and yourselves. So some of the main things that doctors can help with are pain, nausea and constipation. So that can be looking at medications. Diarrhea usually caused by antibiotics rather than the feed. So it's always worth discussing with us or reviewing the medications if your patient's experiencing any of these symptoms. This is a bit of information about refeeding syndrome. So this isn't a singular condition, it's a group of things that happens. Basically when a patient doesn't eat for a while, they go into starvation mode. And if that happens, we want to gradually reintroduce intake rather than give them a lot in one go. So often the dietitians will assess when a patient is at risk of refeeding. Um, and then often we'll suggest things like Pabronex, Thiamine, Vitamin B. If you are thinking anyone might be risk of refeeding, so they've not eaten anything or much in more than five days or they've been nil by mouth they've lost a lot of weight they're very underweight it's worth speaking to the dietitian and raising your concerns about refeeding and also building up intake gradually food fortification is one of the first line things that we can do on the ward for patients that might be malnourished or at risk of malnutrition and this is essentially adding extras into the food that's not adding a lot of volume the, the ward hostesses and the nurses will be able to do all this, but you can discuss it with your patients as well and encourage them. So extra snacks, extra milk, adding things like cream and butter and sugar into the food to get a bit more calories in. The second line thing we'd then go on to, if a patient's malnourished or not meeting their requirements, would be nutritional supplements. So we have Fresubin and Meritine in this hospital. Meritine isn't prescribable, it's just available from the kitchen. Again, it's important to discuss with us and refer to the dietitians because you can over-prescribe if a patient's refeeding risk. You don't want to give them too many supplements at first. And also there's specific ones that we might give, for example, looking at fibre or volume and making sure we get the best supplement for the patient. The routes for artificial nutrition that we can have or the patients can have so NG will be the most common one we have on the wards. That's nasogastric tube. NJ is nasogeginal. We have then also got a peg and a rig. So these are longer term ones. Jejunostomy, so um, going into the jejunum and parenteral nutrition, which is um, IV. The dietitian will assess which one is required. We can provide advice. The nutrition nurse as well can provide advice on, for example, when a patient might be suitable or might require a peg and a rig. So if any of your patients need any of these, refer to the dietitian, discuss with us. A bit more about NG feeding. So this is usually short term for inpatients. A patient can't be discharged with an NG because there's no community support. So usually it's under four weeks of feeding with an NG. And if they require longer term, that's when we start looking at a peg or a rig. 
You can't feed with a Rios tube, they're not NPSA compliant, so just make sure when you're inserting them that it's an NG, not a Rios. This is some information about PEG feeding, which I'll let you read through. So PEG is longer term feeding and the patient can be discharged with a PEG. It should be an MDT decision whether a patient needs a PEG. PEG should be considered first rather than RIG because it's less invasive. It's got a less um, of an infection risk and it doesn't need as much care once it's in. Some of the possible contraindications for a PEG would be if you can't pass the scope. So for example, if they've got a large tumour or if they've got trismus, if they've got a poor prognosis, it might not be appropriate. Um, you need to look at if they've got any previous abdominal surgery or scars, some ethical issues, obesity and hernias. Again, the dietitian and nutrition nurse can advise on this. Rigs are the other type of long-term feeding that we often use. So again, like I said previously, if a patient has trismus or a tumour, we can't pass a scope, then we'd often go for a rig. The contraindications are similar to that of a PEG, so poor patient condition or prognosis, ethical issues, also thinking can the patient manage it if it falls out. Rigs are a bit more high maintenance than a PEG because they've got the balloon in, so it needs monthly balloon water checks. What to do if a PEG or rig falls out? The most important thing is maintaining the tract. If the patient's at home, we need to tell them to go to A&E straight away. We've only got a few hours before that hole is going to close up, so we need to make sure that we get a new one reinserted as soon as possible. If they're an inpatient, ringing endoscopy um, or radiology, depending on the type of insertion, so rig or a PEG. With the care of the tubes, they need to be cleaned daily. Like I said before, the rigs have balloon water changes monthly, and they need to be advanced and rotated weekly after the stitches are out. So like you can see in the pictures, for the PEG tube, A is the feeding port, B is the bumper so that holds it in place, and C is the clamp. For the rig, again, A is the feeding port, D is the balloon volume port, so that's where we change the water, and B again is the bumper that holds it in place, so they are slightly different looking. For anyone going home with home enteral feeding, so going home with a PEG or a rig, we need to make sure the patient is prepared before they go home. So we need to make sure they know how to use it, they can administer the feed. We have to refer to the nurses and set them up with the feed deliveries. So we need to make sure that we're giving enough notice to make sure everything's in place for them to go home. Out of area patients as well will require a little bit more time so we have to hand over and hand over to a different company to get the feed set up. So as soon as you know when they might be going home, please let us know. A little bit now about palliative and end-of-life care. Weight loss and reduced kind of intake is often quite common in end-of-life patients. So we usually, depending on the stage of end-of-life and palliation, we usually just kind of suggest eating what they want to. If the patient already has enteral feeding, it's their decision if we want to carry that on. But if they haven't, we need to think, is it appropriate to be commencing enteral feeding? And often it isn't if they're end-of-life. Also remembering that enteral feeding is legally a medical intervention. Also, it's important to be honest with families. So they might be worried that the patient or the relative is going to be starving to death. So we just need to reassure them that the patient probably won't be feeling hungry. Also making sure the patient knows what to expect. So just discussing with them what's going on. And now just some useful contacts. So the speech and language therapist Joe, Kate and Joe, their extension is 4190 bleep 2205. Marie, the nutrition nurse, is extension 6146 bleep 1710. And if you had any questions, you can always contact us on extension 3011 or catch us on the ward.